السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فلما ذهبوا به وأجمعوا أن يجعلوه في غيابة الجب وأوحينا إليه لتنبئنهم بأمرهم هذا وهم لا يشعرون وجاءوا أباهم عشاء يبكون قالوا يا أبانا إنا ذهبنا نستبق وتركنا يوسف وتركنا يوسف عند متاعنا فأكله الذئب وما أنت بمؤمن لنا ولو كنا صادقين وجاءوا على قميصه بدم كذب قال بل سولت لكم أنفسكم أمرا فصبر جميل والله المستعان على ما تصفون بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. We welcome everyone back to the study of uh, Surah Yusuf, the story of the great prophet uh, Yusuf alayhi salatu wa sallam. And we move on to the next scene now where they go off with Yusuf alayhi salam to the uh, conspiratorial picnic, if you will, um, to launch their scheme and their um, plot against Yusuf alayhi salam. And so Allah azza wa jal says in the first verse you heard here, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ So when they went off with him, وَأَجْمَعُوا أَنْ يَجْعَلُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبِّ And they became resolute. They all were in agreement to send him down into the bottom of the well. And then subhanAllah, uh, well, let me just finish the verse. Uh, <laughs> and we reveal to him, Yusuf, at that moment, you will surely inform them about this. This treacherous deed they, they are performing. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they do, just don't realize. Well, at a time when they, when, at this time or at the time they inform them, Allah knows best, they will, ha, will be totally uh, oblivious to that or totally off guard. They don't realize you're going to inform them or you will inform them at a time when they had no idea and no suspicion. You're going to take them by surprise and confront them with this. So, there are many reflections that I have about this one verse, and I hope it doesn't take our entire session, uh, just so we can move along uh, into the story with a, a medium speed. But Allah Azza wa Jal says, when they went off with him, and they all were in agreement to send him down into the bottom of the well. But then it kind of interrupts. Uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, in, in certain, I guess, movies. Uh, I used to watch movies a long time ago. <laughs> uh, when the scene is very gruesome, uh, or the scene is just known, uh, that every time the bad guy corners the good, right, it just, it flips over to the next screen. Another victim, another victim, another victim. Uh, and so it doesn't pronounce the, the victimization very much, doesn't illustrate the, the gruesome scene very much. It moves on to, to, to another scene. And similarly, this kind of happens here, and and I, and I I wondered like why is there the interjection, right? Like when they went off and they agreed that they're going to put him in, the verse doesn't say then they put him in, it just says and we, meaning at the time that they threw him in the well, that part is skipped, it's not spelled out. We reveal to him, uh, and perhaps the of the wisdoms here is that. 
this is a very traumatic scene, a very graphic scene. And this surah came down uh, to get the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as some of our scholars said, get him past the trauma of being campaigned against and persecuted and exiled from Mecca. Uh, and so it was telling him that these moments come and go. They pass. They don't last. The trials of this world don't last. You know, they either end or we end. They either leave us or we leave them and move on to another world. It, the, the pain of this world is temporary. Uh, and that's something that uh, is very important to remember. Everyone's getting tested and no one's test is permanent. And so it's highlighting Yusuf alayhi salam's test as well. He also was being thrown out or being separated from his loved ones and the comfort of life and the company of his family. And the same way you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are being pushed away from Mecca by your family, by your clansmen. And some scholars say this surah coming down at that point, right before the migration, the, the fleeing from Mecca and migrating to Medina for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was to hint also at the fact that he would return, right? Because the surah ends with the return of the brothers and the reunion and everyone uh, that's around at the end of the story, turning a new leaf to the end of it. And Mecca does become Muslim after, right? Uh, seven, eight painful years after the hijrah. And so perhaps that's the reason why the, the, that scene is skipped, because it is very graphic. There's such trauma in that scene. Like you can imagine when Allah says, and they went off with him and they all were in full agreement. Like they, all of them, even though one could have been enough because he's the, the helpless, weak youngster, Yusuf alayhi salam, they all grab him, right? And they all pull his shirt off because they needed the shirt as, as you may know from how the story continues. And you can maybe like, just let your imagination wander of what that must have looked like. He probably like thought it was a joke at the beginning and then like, oh, this is serious. And then looking around for what brother is going to knock some sense into the other brother who's being, you know, who's being savage here. Someone like stop him. And then he looks around at their eyes and they're all in full agreement. Like the, the, the betrayal here is, is un, like the last thing an innocent child expects from his older brothers for all of them to coalesce and agree on doing this to you. Uh, but at the same time, the verse says what? It doesn't say that there's a happy ending at the end of the story. It says, and this is a very important lesson, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ And we reveal to him, then and there. Many scholars, perhaps most of the tafsir scholars, if I'm not mistaken, say that this was a revelation of reassurance, not the revelation of prophethood. Like, when Allah says we reveal to him, usually revelation means you're a prophet. But this is a different kind of revelation because in the Quran, the word wahi has multiple usages, right? Allah revealed to, meaning he inspired uh, to, the, to the honeybee on how to like construct its, its hives and its homes and its niches in the mountains and elsewhere. Allah Azza wa Jal um, said he revealed or inspired within the mother of Moses to cast him into the well, into the river or the sea when she fears for him. And so uh, this is one of those, uh, according to the majority of scholars, an inspiration or a revelation that is beneath prophethood, meaning he's not a prophet yet. He became a prophet later and Allah knows best. And so, but why, why are we trying to prove that he received revelation before becoming a prophet? To open the door for you <laughs> and for me. Meaning, when a person is close to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah instills inside him certain notions, certain feelings that soothe his wounds, like soothe the trauma, uh, soothe the pain, uh, reassurances that are as clear as day. Like, they're not like, oh, inshallah, this will get better. They're not a hunch, it's not just wishful thinking. Uh, the closer you are to Allah, the more reinforcement you get in the midst of your crisis from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's of the ways that Allah eases for us our difficulties. You know, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna ma'a al usri yusra, certainly uh, along with, ma'a means with, along with the hardship there is ease. Very famous verse, everyone knows it. What does it mean? The scholar said, of what this means is that the end of the hardship is destined along with the beginning of the hardship. Right, So the, the point of relief comes with, it's almost like this is your life and this is the hardship. It comes like this. This is the beginning, this is the end. Right, So it's passing through. It's not like the, the 
hardship is decreed on you and then Allah will later decree when it will end. No, with the hardship comes the ease to remind you of the temporary, temporary nature, the transience of the hardship. The other meaning, this is the meaning I want here, along with the hardship, there is ease. When you are going through hardship, Allah instills within that episode of your life means, subtle means to bring you ease. So in this case with Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah placed inside him a, a sense of surety, right? He was sure that he would not die here and he would confront his brothers about this. And sometimes you need that, like you need to act, you need to take someone to task so that you can forgive them even, right? You just, you have to express, you hurt me, you know? You did this, you did that, uh, and then you forgive them. Some, some crimes are so big that uh, people need to own them before they get forgiven for them. Uh, they need to concede to them, they need to apologize for them, or at least admit them. And so with the hardship comes ease. Many times when someone is close to Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, you know, he can be going, his marriage could be on the brink. And then Allah Azza wa Jal causes him to find himself sitting next to the right person that tells him a story about how his marriage is far worse and how he sees the benefit in, in powering through the, the marital, you know, roller coaster. And so when he hears this guy's story, he realized that his, his problems aren't so bad. That's how within the hardship there is ease. It's embedded inside to alleviate it for you. But the caveat here, the trick here, is for you to have rapport with Allah Azza wa Jal, to have good credit, to have a good balance with Allah before the hardship comes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this, تَعَرَّفْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ Get to know Allah, meaning get acquainted, you know, build a relationship with Allah in times of ease. يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ he will know you in times of difficulty, meaning he'll be there for you uh, in a special way, more than he is for others. He will be there for you uh, in times of difficulty. And so, number one, realize that this story was a, a reassurance for the Prophet wasallam because he was about to be driven out by his people, separated from his family and his clansmen in Mecca. Uh, and so Surah Yusuf came down uh, to tell him there's a happy ending. Um, and the path is one, this is the path of the prophets. Prophets before you went through this as well. And also for us, by the way, that anyone's going through some hardship, they lose out on some of life's comforts or the company of their loved ones. Uh, this is the path of the prophets. Uh, you hold on just a little longer, it'll all be over soon, and your, uh, their triumph will be your triumph, and their final destination will become your final destination. May Allah Azza wa Jal help everyone that's, that's going through hardship uh, pass it, pass the test with flying colors and ease for us the, the, the viciousness of the, of the trials allow us to, to take it in stride and not be broken or brought to our knees by it. Allahumma ameen. And so that was the first thing, why this surah came down. It is really pronounced uh, in this ayah, right? The, the quickness of the mention of the betrayal and the mention that at that moment, Yusuf alayhi salam, was given by Allah a sense of certainty that this is not going to be the end, uh, which made it easier for him to handle what is so hard to handle, the betrayal of your big brothers, all of them. Uh, and the second thing, the third thing now that we want to say about this ayah very quickly, because we are not doing well on time, <laughs> is that Yaqub alayhi salam, as we kind of mentioned last week, tried very hard to... Uh, not let Yusuf go with them because he was pretty sure that, that he would be in danger, that there's something suspicious happening here. But at the end of the day, he couldn't. And this is healthy for us to recognize that, you know, every parent wants a good, safe life for their child, but you can't always offer it, no matter who you are. Um, they may not listen to your advice or you may not be around. I mean, most children outlive their parents that you may not be around to advise them at that moment, or the other person who can advise them in your place that Allah sends may not notice it. Uh, so he'll advise them on some things, but overlook others that are just as necessary, if not more uh, perilous and danger, pose greater dangers to our kids. And so we're gonna advise them, we're going to try our best to, to direct them in their path, but we need to believe that Allah is the truest protector and that we need to rely on him and teach our children to rely on him because we are not the best protectors for our kids. We can never be. Uh, recognizing that is a treasure. You know, as one of the Salaf, the early Muslims would say, 
Kenzi Ajzi Wahinaya Fakri. My treasure is my incompetence, like me recognizing my incompetence, my inability to do certain things, just part of human limitation, right? Whether it's because I don't have the right resources, whether I'm so emotionally invested that I can't like be logical about things and be reasonable, I'm, I'm just, my hands are tied in so many different ways. So me recognizing my inability is actually my treasure because it causes me to turn around and resort to someone who has better abilities. And that of course should deliver you to Allah Azza wa Jal. So he says, my treasure is my inability, وَغِنَايَ فَقْرِي And my riches lie in my poverty. Me recognizing that I'm poor causes me to access uh, the treasure chests of the one who is the most rich, the one whose reservoirs and resources never deplete, never end. And then after that, the next verse continues that they come to their father, Isha and Yabakun. They come to their father at night crying. Uh, maybe this will be the last verse we cover just for time purposes. I was ambitious, but we're not going to cover the three, four verses today. They came to their father at night. Why did they come to their father at night? They came to the father at night so that their, their fake crying won't show. Right? Like, it's, you know, you, I see it in your face, especially with a parent. They can, you know, uh, catch it a mile away. So they came at night. Uh, and they came at night crying. Um, maybe they really were crying, but it wasn't genuine crying. And that by itself is a huge lesson, right? Number one, uh, the deception that is uh, inseparable from the night, right? Deception works in the dark. It's part of, like, the definition, right? It tries to catch people. Uh, off guard, tries to get things past people. The night time is a time when much evil takes place, right? I'm just, uh, clubs happen at night. Lots of, most robbery happens at night in dark alleyways, right? Uh, so the night is a time of great danger. This is not to make someone paranoid, a'udhu billah. I mean, the, the stronger your faith in Allah, the more fearless you become in terms of confronting your fears. If you need to be out, you need to be out. But we should beware of uh, not being home at night <laughs> when we don't, or our children not being home at night, uh, or what our children are doing at night, sometimes even at home, because the night is when just so much evil happens. The night is actually, the Prophet ﷺ said, when the shayateen become, uh, when they, I guess, they, they set out. The Prophet ﷺ even told us to bring your children in at the beginning of the night. Because that's when like the, the rabid shayateen come out, right? Later on in the night, if it's safe, you know, supervision or whatever else, if it's safe, fine, let them play. Uh, given other measures are, are put in place. But just the onset of the night is something we should be wary about. The night is a time of privacy. It's a time of uh, resigning to your homes, a time of resigning to your families, a time of resigning to your worship. And we should keep it that way. I mean, I think COVID helped us uh, a, a little bit, and we should try to hold on to as much of that as possible. The night was made for sleep, unless people are forced to be awake for you know a noble cause, such as serving their family or serving some uh, some great cause, uh, or, or otherwise. But generally speaking, some of the Salaf used to, before they go to sleep, they would just have a regiment of just saying, Alhamdulillah, 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 that I'm home. Because at night is when people are vulnerable, right? At night is when people are sinning. At night, so the fact that I am home, not fornicating right now, not partying in a haram way right now, you know, the, the fact that I am not uh, outside of a home on the, on the receiving end of someone's, you know, malicious acts right now. Realize this, the, the, so much evil happens under the wings of the night. And... Then they cried, and that's a lesson, that we, we don't believe someone because they're crying. Uh, and that is the beautiful balance that our Dean teaches us. You are supposed to be empathic, feel people's pain, uh, but also do not be gullible and naive and manipulated by people who are pretending to be in pain. Uh, because there are people who master uh, pulling tears out of their eyes. They're good at it for a whole bunch of different reasons. They just, when they feel like they should, they do. Not because they are overwhelmed and so they do. 
uh, it helps them, you know, convince others. It helps them silence their own conscience. If you are involved in community work like an imam, like Sheikh Walid Basuni once said, you will realize that so many people come to you crying, and if you're overtaken, you know, people that 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 are in places of exacting justice, like whether an imam has moral authority or like, you know, if you're in a, like a, a judicial, a judge position or like an arbiter where you feel like it's your responsibility to do, you become more prone to look for injustice and so you, you think you found it prematurely many times. You gotta be careful. Uh, and so people come to you crying and then once you hear the other side of the story, you realize that they could be the guiltier party a lot of times. Uh, you know, I always mention to people that Al-Hasan, Rahimahullah Al-Basri would tell people uh, if someone comes to me, not just crying, he says with his eye gorged out, someone like poked out his eye, I would not judge in his favor. Like, you know, when someone comes to you, not just crying, like they're gashed or something, you just jump up and you just, you, you're, you're at their service and who did this to you? And you're, you're ready to raise hell, as they say. But he says, I will not judge in his favor until I check the other party first. Maybe he poked out both of their eyes, right? Maybe they are the guilty party. And so if you are someone who is uh, moved by injustice, you should be, uh, you need to be careful of jumping in too early. This happens all the time. In the process of seeking justice, you can prematurely, uh, you know, uh, identify uh, what is justice as an uh, injustice or the opposite, right? Uh, and that happens a lot. I mean, think of Musa alayhi salam. He was so passionate about defending the oppressed that he, he separated a fight and with, with such authority, such strength, that he killed a man, right? And then the next day he saw the, what he thought was the victim fighting another person. And so he realized that this guy's a troublemaker. Uh, he's picking fights and then dragging us into them to rescue him each time. And so he was the instigator. And so we should be very aware of this, that crying does not mean that your claim is justified. It doesn't. Even the Prophet ﷺ warned us of people's eloquence as well. Just because they can present their argument better doesn't mean they're more right. It just means they can speak better. And that's why he told them, I am uh, but a human being. The Prophet ﷺ said this, I am but a human being uh, and I judge based on what I hear. And some of you may be more articulate, like just better at expressing themselves, making a case for themselves than others. So if I give you uh, the verdict, I, ver I pass a verdict in your favor, when you know this is the right of your brother, then don't take it. Meaning you have to use your conscience as well. You can't just throw this on the judge that you tricked. Then do not take your brother's right because you would only be taking a coal from the fire. Meaning this will burn through you. This will, this will wind up in great punishment. And so someone's eloquence is not proof of their case being justified. Someone's lying is not proof of them being justified. Sometimes even them bleeding. Uh, does it mean that their claim is justified? And the Prophet ﷺ said this, and I'll close with it, لَوْ يُعْطَ النَّاسُ بِدَعْوَاهُمْ If people were given simply based on their claims, meaning without, without enough proof, and I just said what isn't proof, right? What isn't enough proof? Crying, articulation, uh, bleeding even. <laughs> without clear, undeniable proof, uh, he said then so many people would claim the rights and the blood and the wealth of others and then he said, proof is the onus uh, of the uh, plaintiff. You're making a complaint, you have to bring the proof. And whomever is the defendant, they need to swear an oath that their, uh, their claim is wrong if they don't have the proof for it. And they walk scot-free, as they say. Proven uh, innocent until proven guilty. And proof is not the tears or the... Uh, the eloquent words. Jazakallah uh, khairan. We'll end there inshallah ta'ala asking Allah to benefit us from his book and help us walk this world with, uh, with a light that we extract from his book and illuminate for ourselves and our surroundings the decisions we make and the perspectives we have. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan. Subhanakallahumma alhamdulillah. Shadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum.